So with this, we've officially come to the end of the Monster Association slash Garo arc and or saga. It's been a very long time. It started like over seven years ago. And in my opinion, I think it has a pretty satisfying ending here. But then again, I am kind of like a Garo stan. So maybe I appreciated it more than the average viewer. But first, I want to thank the team that was able to provide us with these translations. They crush it as usual. And without them, we'd be in the dark for like a long time. So thank you guys. But anyway, the chapter opens up here with us seeing Garo at a police station, and he's kind of like spilling the beans about everything. Ultimate goal is plans, the whole absolute unbiased evil stuff. And I've always kind of thought of this as like Garo's shonen MC goal, because I've always kind of saw Garo as like a warped shonen protagonist, if anything. And I think that's what one was going for with him, to be honest. Like instead of becoming like the Hokage or the Pirate King, he wanted to become absolute unbiased evil and bring world peace that way. Hey, also guys, if you like my One Punch Man content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. But it turns out that he's not at the police station to answer for those crimes, but he's there to make a report about the Dine and Dash stuff. This happened way back in chapter 87. The whole thing where after Garo's fight with Bang and Bomb, he went to this diner, ate everything on the menu, and then just left without paying the bill. And it eventually wound up with Saitama running into him and like One Punch punching him without even realizing that you know, it was Garo. But this is like the first of two big surprises here because not only is Garo here and we're seeing him so soon, but he's with Bang. So this is like super surprising to me because I really didn't expect us to see him so soon. Because originally in the webcomic, it takes like 17 chapters before we see him again. And that took like five years in real time. And as for Bang being with Garo here, that still hasn't happened in the webcomic. Like I just expected this to happen much later on in the story, but I'm not mad at it or anything. It just, I don't know, it feels odd that Bang and Garo have reunited here. But Bang is essentially reforming Garo, if anything. Like, that's the big theme of this chapter. But an interesting thing here is Garo telling Bang, like, don't tell me what to do. You're not my dad. And then, like, the narration says Garo's parents never showed up to his detention. And that, you know, brings up a great point. It's like, yeah, who are Garo's parents? I mean, granted, we don't know the parents of everyone. I mean, we don't know any of Saitama's family, and we probably never will. But Garo is still relatively young. Like, he's 18, so you'd expect him to be in his life somewhat, but they're not. And Bang has always kind of been that father figure to him, for the most part, because we saw in season two, at least, that Garo found Bang's dojo when he was, like, still a kid. And going further into this sequence, we get the whole Star-Lord and Yondu moment, where it's like, I may not be your father, but I'm your daddy. Because Bang's like, all it takes to become a parent is to have children, but you can't become a teacher without leading the way for them. And Garo's like, you know what? Can't argue with that. Then we get a flashback to when Bang found Garo. I guess this happened uh, sometime after he lost to Saitama in the previous chapter. And we see Garo under a waterfall. And this is super interesting because this is originally where we see Garo again for the first time in the webcomic, 17 chapters after he's defeated by Saitama. But it's actually King that finds Garo, not Bang. Going forward, Bang thinks to himself, saying, like, I'm the one who showed you where these secret training grounds were. He may well have wanted me to find him. And I'm pretty sure that's the case. Like, Garo ultimately wanted to reunite with Bang. But, you know, the way that Garo is, he can't just straight up say, I'm sorry, Sensei, take me back. But Garo says, the only reason I came back to you is so I can remember my fist. And then essentially that Bang is the only one on his level. And that he only really wants to spar against him to get stronger. Then Garo asked Bang, like, how Tario's doing. And we cut to Tario and he's kind of reliving Garo's childhood here. As to where, like, they're on a very similar playground that we saw, and they're forcing Tario to be the monster, and the three bully kids are, you know, justice kicking him the same way that Garo was kicked. But the difference here is that Tario has, like, an upbeat demeanor, and he's not feeling necessarily victimized the way that Garo was, but he's kind of embracing this role. I'm Garo, man, the hero. And you guys are actually fake heroes. So in a way, Garo is kind of a achieving at least partially one of his goals, and that is mitigating Teru 
who's bullying here by showing that you can be like a hero, but you don't have to be a hero in the traditional sense. You could be like the anti-hero like Garo, which is something that Garo didn't necessarily have when he was a child. He kind of construed monsters into being anti-heroes, if anything, with the traditional heroes being like these unjust bullies, which is obviously a flawed mindset that led Garo to the path that he, you know, went on, which of course turned him full-blown anti-villain. And then we see Waganma pull up, and apparently he's just full-blown buddies with Tario at this point. Understandable, because, you know, they bonded together by both being kidnapped during, you know, the majority of this arc. And Tario being friends with Waganma has impressed the, the bully kids, because, you know, Waganma's, like, super rich. He's the son of Narinki, who's, like, you know, one of the big donors to the Hero Association. So it's basically showing us that Tario's doing fine. Waganma has had his character arc, and he's not, like, a awful bratty kid anymore, at least for the most part. And Garo's like, do your best, Tario. I'm gonna do the same. And then going forward, Garo says something super interesting to Bang, where he says, You think you could arrange some sort of fighting contest with the heroes for me? The ones I fought after turning into a monster were you, Bomb, Flash, Blast, and that weird bald guy, Saitama, or something. If I take them all on in order, I'm pretty sure I could reach some sort of awakening without monsterizing this time. So I really don't know if this is going to be a thing, because, like, this doesn't happen in the webcomic or anything. Like, there's no future tournament that Bang organizes with, like, heroes showing up and sparring Garo or fighting him or whatever. So if this actually does happen, I think that would be super interesting. And we may see something like this happen, like at least for training purposes for like everyone to get stronger, but also Garo saying reach some sort of awakening without monsterizing. This is amazing too, because this is like Garo's future power up as to where he's going to become, you know, above dragon level possibly without having to go down the route of monsterizing. I don't think he's referring to like removing his limiter because I really doubt anyone's going to remove their limiter besides Saitama in the entire series, but maybe he can get to the point of, like, breaking it again. And also, you know, it's never really been fully explained what breaking it means, aside from just removing it, obviously. But then Bang's like, oh, so you think you can beat me? Don't get ahead of yourself. After all, my back has been feeling quite good since Metal Knight performed the full body maintenance on us. So, this is interesting, right? This is in reference to what happened at the end of the previous chapter when Metal Knight conveniently showed up at the very end of the battle started to clean everything up and said that he was going to perform mandatory maintenance on everyone to like decontaminate them get them rid of like the radiation that they had and I guess he also did some other stuff and helped them out and I guess this is uh, supposed to make you partly suspicious of Metal Knight for sure right because that's the game that one has been playing he wants you to think that Metal Knight is your enemy as Drive Knight put it but uh, I'm pretty sure by now you know my stance Metal Knight is not not the bad guy here, it's actually Drive Knight. But anyway, we come back to the Hero Association and we see Second Guard talking to Sitch. They're talking about Garo here, and Sitch says Silver Fang will become his guardian and will introduce him to the association eventually. Now, I don't know if that literally means that Garo is like going to join the Hero Association and become an S-Class hero, but anything is possible at this point, I guess. It's just hard to see Garo willingly doing that. Because while he is like a good guy, now still think the core fundamental of him is still opposed to just the whole idea of a hero and the hero association itself right but i do think that he will fight alongside the heroes for sure he'll be more so like a vigilante if anything we also find out that bang has submitted his resignation bang is like straight up retiring from being a hero here and i guess he's just going to focus full time on reforming garo now i don't necessarily think this means that silver fang is going to be benched for the rest of the series like i'm sure he's going to fight eventually maybe in the final arc but for this next big saga we're going into don't expect bang to get his hands dirty at least the way that he did in the previous one so then we come back to bang and garo and we get this funny interesting sequence here where bang asks garo if there's any girls he likes and surprisingly garo fesses up and he says that he likes the girl who plays the yellow ranger in some sentai show and Murata actually draws her for us at the end of the chapter and he says that she resembles garo's mom so garo has like an oedipus complex i guess but anyway bang's like but aren't the yellow ones in sentai shows usually the big strong curry loving types and garo's like Pfft. 
Your info is out of date, old man. Let me tell you about Sentai nowadays. So this is like super interesting to me at least because we're like going more into Garo than we really ever have before. Like we hardly really get to know Garo as like a person outside of like his whole being a martial artist and the absolute unbiased evil aspect of him. So he's like a Sentai nerd apparently and he's into the Yellow Ranger. And I think this is really cool and then we come to the final page of the chapter and we see genos and saitama just like hanging out at ground zero but the real reason they're here is because they're looking for like stuff from saitama's apartment because saitama's like i sure hope the first thing we find is a hot pot because you know most of z city including saitama's apartment was destroyed in the battle here but we see this rustle behind a rock in the distance. All right, so we're back, and it's been a little over a month since the last chapter, but this one's opening up with us seeing like dorms, I guess, at the Hero Association. I suppose that this is like a new development that they implemented after the whole Big Monster Association slash Garo battle. And we're coming to what is uh, said to be Saitama's apartment, at least according to King. And this makes sense because we saw that Saitama lost his apartment complex in the battle that took place at Sea City. So now I guess he moved into the Hero association here with uh, some other heroes and these other heroes that we see here are butterfly dx who we saw in the hundred eyes octopus sequence with flashy flash in season two chain and toad who was a part of death gatling's team to go after garo as well as season two and this other guy here with the beanie his name's forte and in the manga's continuity we've only seen him like one time in the bonus chapter called pork cutlet bowl which i think was in volume seven he was part of the team that mccoy sent to the police station to take on the surprise attack plum monster and butterfly dx and chain toad were part of that team as well so there's a nice little continuity tie in there but they're all a-class heroes and they live on the same floor as saitama and that's pretty interesting it makes you think like hmm why is that but they're kind of like forcefully introducing themselves to him this is more going into like the hazing slash bullying that exists in like the hero association outside of like the s class that has been mentioned throughout the series we saw most prominently with like the blizzard group but instead of saitama answering the door it's king and you know of course king scares them because king is king but he says that he came to visit the guy that lives there as well and then he says you know i wonder where saitama went and that's how we know for sure that this is saitama's new apartment but anyway we're coming back to ground zero at z city and we see like this hero association helicopter tracking down pig god who is also there and it's really interesting how this sequence is playing out because we're seeing like the hero association being pretty aggressive with how he's talking about pig god like good thing we put a tracker on him what's he doing at the monster association disaster zone from the other day and we also see like he brought an a-class hero with him who's rank 35 named air and he's like you brought me here just in case something like this happened didn't you i'll take care of capturing pig god so they're taking like more ownership of the heroes more so than what we've seen before this is more so going to play in what the next big arc of the series is going to be like we're going to be moving more so away from like the monster stuff and we're going to be going more into like hero politics i know that sounds boring but trust me it's not this is kind of just like the beginning of that but we also see in the rubble here that Black S has survived because the last time we saw him was in chapter 152 after 54 trillion of his cells had merged together to become Platinum S like a 100 cell version of him like broke away as insurance but it wound up running into Metal Bat we saw Metal Bat wound up hitting him and we didn't really see what happened after that and that's what led to a lot of confusion like is he going to live is he going to die but the implication here I guess is that this is like one single Black S cell like this is the last one like after Metal Bat hit the one hundred cell version of him just one was able to survive and this is it but we see the a-class hero air here is like really aggressive towards pig god like trying to get him to come back to the med lab we can assume that this is the med lab that maybe metal knight oversees because we saw at the end of 168 that he was kind of taking in all of the heroes that were on the battlefield to be decontaminated and checked on and whatnot but he's like looking for a fight like he actively wants to fight pig god the level of delusion here is you know typical of what we've seen earlier on in the series of these heroes but he just assumes that he can take pig god now because he lost to garo <laughs> but we're also finding out here that not only black s has survived but also evil natural water there's like a little puddle version of him here and this goes back to chapter 157 because after saitama had serious punched evil natural ocean and parted him like moses did to the red sea with a beyblade we saw that his eyeballs were still intact afterwards and we speculated that like oh this probably means that he's coming back and this is precisely why pig god has returned to the battlefield here to make sure that not only evil natural 
natural water was dead, but he assumed that other monsters had survived as well. But even in this little puddle form, evil natural water is still like a serious threat because he like one shots air with one of his water jets right through the throat. And then Pig God just immediately eats him, but wounds up getting shot like from inside. And uh, Pig God just shakes this off because Pig God has like regenerative abilities. <laughs> like this was originally mentioned in the manga, but then it was like retconned and then later added to a bonus chapter for some reason. But yeah, like his fat has like regenerative properties. I'm not sure about his organs that are getting messed up here, but I guess it doesn't matter. Like Pig God's just gonna be fine. Like he's just gonna eat some ramen apparently and then he'll just regenerate from this. So yeah, Evil Natural Water's dead now, thanks to Pig God. But then we come back to Black S who's like observing Saitama rummaging through the debris in Z City here because he's looking for like his apartment. We saw him doing this with Genos at the end of the previous chapter. And when Black S spots him, he realizes that Saitama was the one who zero punched Garo. And this is really important because now this means that like Black S is one of like, I don't know, two or three characters that knows the truth of what had happened. I mean, obviously Genos knew. But outside of that, everyone else is kind of under the assumption that it was Blast who defeated Garo and then just dipped out. But the twists don't stop there because as Saitama like pulls up the portion of his apartment complex that has his apartment in it, suddenly Rover pops out of here and we see Genos hold him up. But he's obviously much smaller now. And this is interesting because we haven't seen Rover in a very long time. I I think maybe the last time we saw him was chapter 125. I could be wrong, but that was after he had fought Bang and Bomb and got like Crossfang Dragon Slayer Fist and Bang like inadvertently told him to sit and he obeyed him, which implied that he was like almost fully conditioned at that point because that's kind of like the story of Rover. Like he would get into a fight with somebody, get hit really hard and be told to sit. And then I guess the third time around, it just conditioned him fully. Like we saw it with Garo, saw it with Saitama most prominently, obviously. And I guess that was the straw that broke the camel's back with Bang and Bomb. But he also may have gotten smaller after every battle. And I guess we could just assume that, you know, going through the Monster Association being pulled out of the ground, everything else that happened on the battlefield, like it just messed him up and he just just shrunk down for some reason. I'm not really sure why. It's never explained why he shrinks, but it's convenient to make him cuter and a, more of a plot device for Saitama to adopt him here, I guess. Now, I don't know if Saitama like recognizes that this is Rover that he had punched before, or this is just, you know, typical oblivious Saitama and he doesn't really care because he sees that like, oh, hey, this is just a dog that's not aggressive and he's nice. So I, he's just adopting him now because because he feels like it. But Black S is like observing this and he realizes that Saitama is maybe the kind that just avoids needless violence and that he won't kill you as long as you look like some sort of animal that's I guess just not aggressive, which Saitama has always kind of had that disposition, even with what he recognizes as full-blown monsters. And Black S sees this as like an opportunity because as we've established, he's probably at like one single cell right now. And he says that he's so weak that even a puppy could beat him. So he's super vulnerable. And now that he knows that Saitama is the one above all, he really realizes that, oh, the best place to be right now would be taking refuge with someone who cannot be defeated. And that way he can bide his time and eat more and build up his cell stock. But also at this time, Genos conveniently says that he has things to take care of at Hero Association headquarters and he leaves. And then right after that, Black S appears in front of Saitama at the very end of the chapter, seemingly acting like an animal or something. So what is Black S scheming here? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but I assume that he's still 100% a heel. Like, I don't think he's having a face turn here. Like, he may seem more affable to the audience for the foreseeable future, but I do think that he is up to no good. Like, once he regains enough of his strength, gets back to his normal state, or maybe even surpasses that, I think that eventually he will become one of God's, like, main disciples. Because it's kind of subtly implied that he may be, like, a primordial monster. Like, he was directly made by God, kind of like how Sage Centipede was, or at least that's my theory on him. As for Rover, the verdict's still out. He's kind of having a face turn here, I guess, because he's not really that intelligent. He kind of just needs ownership and commands, if anything, but I wouldn't be surprised if 
Black S like influences him later on as well to turn heel again. But so coming off of the end of the previous chapter, we saw Saitama rummaging through the wreckage of Z City after the battle with the Monster Association and Garo looking for stuff from his apartment that was destroyed. And he randomly encountered Rover who had survived the battle, but then is also turned into like a small version of himself. But we also saw him encounter Black S and we're finding out what's happening here. And Saitama's like, I told you not to follow me. Get off of me already. And Black S is like wasting no time revealing that he can like straight up speak. And he's like, don't be like that. Come on, let me come with you. And Saitama like thinks that he's a weird monkey for some reason. Like, I honestly don't know like how earnest Saitama is in this sequence because Saitama's intellect and perception kind of goes in like peaks and valleys in this series. Sometimes he's like a secret genius and sometimes he's just like a complete buffoon. And this is kind of like the latter here. Like he's pretty oblivious in this chapter. Like it's pretty funny, but also surprising that he like almost genuinely doesn't realize that Black S is a monster. Maybe he's just choosing to be willfully ignorant because these monsters like aren't aggressive. And as we've seen in the series, Saitama isn't the type to just destroy or kill, you know, no questions asked. He'll only really attack unless he like has to save someone or if he's being attacked himself. But Black S eventually convinces him to begrudgingly let him come and live with him. And they start walking towards the Hero Association, which he says is his new home. And we knew this because in the previous chapter, King was looking for Saitama at his apartment and they were at the Hero Association. But that's because it turns out that there's been a new development to it. Something that we weren't aware of before, but it's always kind of been like an apartment complex as well. Because like when this was originally made, like after Boros destroyed a city, Metal Knight came and built it in like seven days. It apparently can accommodate several thousand households. And you know, considering that the Hero Association doesn't consist of that many people, they decided it was a good idea to rent it out to the wealthy, which is actually a really good idea because as it's also stated in this chapter that the appearance of monsters have become more and more common. Like throughout the series, we see this talked about occasionally. It wasn't always as frequent as it has been in these last couple arcs. And even Crescent Eyebroll says that like even disaster level demons are popping up more than just once a month. And there is a reason for this, of course, actually kind of multiple reasons. And as the series goes on, it's going to be revealed why. It's kind of cool how one is like building up this overarching story. But considering that, it makes sense that the wealthy would want to live here at this stronghold, you know, to protect them from the monsters instead of waiting for the heroes to come save them because it's revealed that the heroes are going to be living here as well, A-class and higher. And they also kind of force some of the A-class heroes to be like their personal bodyguard because as Green says here, it's like the catch to stay there red free. But then some of the wealthy potential tenants are like, yeah, but you know, A-class heroes are kind of strong, but uh, they're only just humans. So that doesn't mean our safety is completely guaranteed. And then the hero association guy giving this presentation is like, yeah, you're right, but there's more because Metal Knight, the guy who built this entire thing, also developed an AI automated defense system. And it's all of these powerful drones. And apparently the entire defense system here alone does a more effective job than all of the A-class heroes combined. And maybe that's true, aside from like a My Mask, of course, because he is technically an A-class hero, even though he's pretty much an S-class. But speaking of the security system, it starts going off. And wouldn't you know it, it's because Saitama is there along with Black S and Rover. And as we just established, it's AI automated and it can detect monsters and still, in this sequence, Saitama is oblivious to the fact that they are monsters and that this system has detected them. He first thinks that like, it's like a metal detector because he has like pots and stuff from like what he was salvaging from his apartment. <laughs> Even Black S is like, boss, you're not good with the machines, are you? And then this huge robot comes out that looks like it's built for like melee and it goes to attack Black S because you know, obviously that's the monster threat, but Saitama just assumes it's attacking him and just takes it out with one smack. And then that activates level four and and then these bigger robots come out that resemble like the War of the World alien robots. While these are more powerful, they're still of course no match for Saitama and he smashes them just like All Might would <laughs> with a smack. And this sets off like the alarms big time. Like the Hero Association workers like in the control room are like, what's on the security camera? I can't see anything with all the smoke. And this is a great deterrent because like if they knew that it was Saitama destroying these robots, then they would realize like, oh crap, he's super powerful. He might even be the strongest hero we have. Obviously it's too soon for that. So we're gonna keep getting these moments where Saitama does something extraordinary, but then something else happens and everyone else is none the wiser. But we see Saitama walking to the Hero Association and just leaving this wreckage of robots 
pieces behind him. And this is very important because obviously Metal Knight is going to find out about this and we're going to get to see what his reaction is. But also this stuff being left behind here is probably going to be salvaged by somebody else. And what I'm going to say here is not confirmed in the webcom. It's hardly even touched on at all, to be honest. But in my opinion, I'm thinking the organization is going to get their hands on some of this stuff. But as Saitama is walking in, the Hero Association workers are like running in the same direction and they catch up with him and they're like, what happened? What was that noise? And Saitama's like, well, those machines at the entrance just suddenly, and he's about to tell them like the truth kind of, but before he can get it out, one of the workers is like, these things cost 9 billion each to develop. And then Saitama starts sweating and he stops himself from talking because obviously he doesn't want to pay the bill on this because 9 billion, which I'm assuming they're going off of the yen is like $60 million. And then he just switches up his tune and starts lying. And he's like, uh, I'm not really sure, but they just exploded. And then conveniently at the same time, King is coming in and he's like, what he said is true. I saw it too. Those robots just kind of suddenly exploded <laughs> and they're like, oh, you're Mr. King. Whoa, I've never met him in person. And of course, because King said it, they believe him. And this is just a great way to cap off this. Just another godly written sequence from one here. Like he does such a good job with the Saitama and King dynamic, especially like when civilians or other people are involved. But like I said before, King in the previous chapter was like looking for Saitama at his apartment anyway. So it's understandable that he'd be here. And then Saitama hands him back his like broken old school Game Boy that he also found at the wreckage. And King's like, no big deal. But as they're talking, we see in the distance, the A-class heroes from the previous chapter that said that they're like the neighbors of Saitama. And I suppose that we're gonna try to haze him or something. Like see him talking to King so casually. And they're like, he's having a serious man-to-man -man conversation with the King. And that guy's a complete newbie. Who the heck is he? So this is like further developing their interest in them. And to be honest, it doesn't really go that far for it to have this much emphasis on it, to be honest, but I guess it still doesn't have its full payoff yet, even in the webcomic, the relationship between Saitama and these three A-class heroes. But then in the final panel, we see that Saitama has ranked up and now he is A-class rank 39. Before this, he was B-class rank seven, and he got this promotion because of his involvement in the battle against the Monster Association and Garo. And as we saw, obviously not everybody knows that he is the one who defeated Garo, of course. When the true future version of Saitama merged with the past slash present version of this Saitama. He was like naked, but also it was too bright and everyone couldn't really make out like who took out Garo. And the big popular opinion was just that it was Blast that did it essentially. I mean, Genos knows of course, but Genos is, you know, tight lipped about it. But also we kind of knew that Saitama was going to be A-class anyway, because we know that he's living in the apartment complex and it just said that only A-class and higher can live there. But yeah, this is certainly going to bring a, a new fun element to the series because Saitama certainly isn't done ranking up, or at least in my opinion. That's not a spoiler or anything. I'm pretty sure this is as high as he is even currently in the webcomic, but I think he will eventually maybe get to S class possibly, and that's going to be interesting if that happens. But a lot more fun to be had in this arc. This is only kind of the beginning of like this bridge arc taking us to the next big long arc of the series. But so this was an incredible chapter. So many reveals in this one. Things that we've been literally waiting years to find out. So with that being said, there's so much to talk about in this one. So let's just get right into it. So coming off of the previous chapter, we saw that Saitama ranked up to A class. And with that, he was able to get an apartment in the Hero Association. And as he was approaching it, he came with Black S and Rover and that set off Metal Knight new defense system. And this caused like a whole bunch of robots to come out and Saitama, of course, easily just destroyed all of them. And we're finding out the aftermath of that because we're seeing like the Hero Association workers like reviewing the footage and talking about it and basically scrutinizing Metal Knight because of this, saying that they basically wasted money on him because it just wound up malfunctioning. And this is because of the excuse Saitama gave them in the previous chapter. Like he didn't straight up tell them that he destroyed it himself because he was afraid of having to pay for them because he found out they're worth like millions of dollars. And then we see Metal Knight himself reviewing the footage. And this is actually the first time in the manga that we're like seeing Metal Knight's like full face for the first time. For some reason, he's able to see like security footage that the other workers weren't able to see where he's just straight up seeing that it was Saitama. And he's like, oh, it was A class rank 39 Cape Baldy. And then he goes over Saitama's accomplishments, but just through the eyes of the Hero Association records. So they're not, you know, 100% truthful. And he's like, you know, based on the videos, he's probably as strong as an S class hero, maybe even stronger. If by some chance he should become an 
an enemy of mine, I'll keep an eye on. So now Metal Knight is like aware that Saitama is potentially the one above all, pretty much. And him saying, you know, if by some chance he become an enemy of mine, I'll keep an eye on him. This is because one wants us to be suspicious of Metal Knight, because obviously Drive Knight talked about many chapters back to Genos and Second Guard that, you know, Metal Knight is a bad guy. So he's kind of keeping that going. But unfortunately, you're watching my video and you probably know my stance on this by now, but I believe personally that Metal Knight is actually not a bad guy. And that Drive Knight is actually the bad guy. I know I sound like a broken record, but take it for what you will. You're probably going to see a bunch of people saying the opposite in the comments and other places on social media. And that's good, but I digress. So then we're coming to this emergency meeting that Sitch is holding because he feels that all of the crazy stuff that happened in the previous chapter is linked to his, the earth is in trouble prophecy. And he's right because we know that most of this stuff is connected to God. And in this meeting, we see Geno, Zombie Man, Flashy Flash, and my Mask. This is important because all of these characters are going to have important storylines going forward. I'll talk more about that at the end. But Sitch is like, you know, everything that we talk about here has to be kept in this room. And Flashy Flash is like, you know, even heroes have reported that it wouldn't be strange for anybody to turn into a monster at any moment. We should stay cautious. But then my Mask is like, wait a second, I don't really get what you're talking about. Could you walk me through it step by step? You're saying that anybody could turn into monsters? So this is interesting, of course, that my Mask would be saying this because way back in the previous arc, after my Mask had defeated Super S, we thought that he had killed her, but it turned out that he actually didn't. And when she woke up, she tasted his blood because she had stabbed him in the eye previously. She was like, this is monster blood. So that, along with the my Mask being able to regenerate from said grievous injury, along with him being ripped in half by Fear Ugly and having his face smashed in, it's looking like a my Mask is pretty much a monster at this point, or something like that, at the minimum. So him saying this here is funny because either he's trying to save face, you know, acting oblivious because he doesn't want them to know that he's a freaking monster, or he somehow genuinely doesn't know that he is a monster. But something is definitely sus about him. But then Sitch asks Zombie Man, he's like, hey, you fought against Homeless Emperor. Is there any important details you want to share about that? And Zombie Man's like, yeah. He said that when he was still a human, he was given divine power by something he called God. So now everybody's aware of the name God. And he's like, yeah, during the fight, I found an opening and I held him down and I was going to make him spill whatever he knew, but suddenly he just started crumbling into salt or ashes and dropped dead. And the last thing he said was God. It seemed like he was trying to be shut up. And then Flashy Flash is like, by chance, did you hear anything being said to you telepathically? Because you know, while we were under the Monster Association, we ran into something and it was trying to grant us power. And it said that if you weren't worthy, then you would face forfeiture. So I'm thinking that the thing that we ran into and the thing that killed Homeless Emperor is probably the same God that you just talked about. And of course he's right because you know, we saw what had happened. And then Flashy Flash asks Sitch, he's like, hey, you know something about what's going on with Blast, don't you? And this is because, you know, after Flashy Flash, Saitama and Monaco encountered the cube and, you know, talked to God, that's when Blast made his first appearance in the manga. So Flashy Flash is aware of Blast and what he's doing for the most part because he told them, you know, he's going after the cubes and the thing connected to them. So there's like no hiding anymore for Sitch because we've known for years that Sitch is tied to Blast in some way and that he knows the truth, but he couldn't talk about it because it's confidential. But now he's just spilling the beans and he's like, to tell the truth, I've been keeping it hidden until now, but for the past 20 years, Blast has been continuously fighting this god you all encounter. He and his partner and a group of many other collaborators, they were searching for a mysterious cube that could turn humans into monsters. And we see Blast with this human hero looking guy. And those of you who have read the webcomic are like jumping up and down right now. And I get it, so was I. But obviously I can't talk about it here because it's massive spoilers for the future of the manga. But just know that I'm gonna make a video after this, in the next couple days, talking about who this guy is and why he's so important to the story and how this all connects to him. So if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe for that. If you wanna know the truth about everything. I mean, it's heavy spoiler stuff, but it's fascinating. But going further, Sitch is like, it has been handed down over time as some kind of communication device with this guy, what some would call a type of O part or an out of place artifact. He had been collecting them and together with his collaborators attempting to analyze them. However, finally two years ago, while Blast was battling Elder Centipede, he came into contact with God directly. He refused the transaction of power and pitted himself against God. So that's another huge reveal here. We're finally getting the answer what had happened between Blast and Elder Centipede. This has been going on for like five years, you know, since we found out that this was even a thing because when King was talking to the Peter Worker, he was like, hey, Blast fought Elder Centipede like two years ago, but I can't talk about it because
that's it's confidential. And for years, people were like, oh, Blast is a weakling because he couldn't even defeat Elder Centipede because it was said that Elder Centipede was able to escape. And I was like, guys, that's not the full story. We don't know everything. And I'm sure you can find some evidence of me in a video that I've made over the past couple of years saying that God is probably involved with that incident. And it turns out that, yeah, of course, God is involved with that incident because he probably created Elder Centipede like he created Sage Centipede. But then Sitch is like realizing that it would be safer if only by a small amount, if the other heroes and employees were unaware of the existence of God, Blast made it seem like he disappeared without giving so much as a reason in order to protect everyone. So that's the reason why Blast went MIA. He was trying to protect everyone from knowing the existence of God because he felt that if everyone was none the wiser, then they would be less susceptible to being influenced by him, I suppose. And then Sitch is like, the only reason Blast was able to do battle with God is because he's a person with the ability to manipulate space time. Other heroes have no means of doing such a thing. And we pretty much knew this was the case. I mean, we saw Blast's abilities, but in response, Genos is like, oh, is that so? And he pulls out the core from the future. And then he goes on to explain to them everything that had happened between Saitama and Cosmic Cure Garo in the previous arc. And it takes them like four hours. And afterwards, Second Guard and Citra are like, no, but you claim he flew to Jupiter, destroyed it, then came back. And on top of that, you say he went back in time and changed history. That's a bit out there. And it's like totally understandable that they would react this way. But Zombie Man trying to make sense of this is like, hey, if that's the case, we can confirm by asking Garo, right? Like, what did the police learn from interrogating him? And Second Guard's like, apparently the shock of the final punch made him lose his memory. So not even Garo is apparently aware that Saitama was the one that punched him. And yes, that directly conflicts with what he said to Bang a couple chapters back about, you know, the people that he would like to fight and in order of their strength, which made it seem like he knew that Saitama was the one that defeated him. But I guess this means that he doesn't know. But then Flashy Flash is like, so we don't have any definitive info at all. So this is a good way of having everyone know and not know at the same time that Saitama is the one above all. There's still that air of doubt. Like they're not completely convinced because they, of course, don't have definitive proof. But then Sitch is like, one thing we can say is that interaction with God's dimension has increased rapidly, Blast said. There might be something in our dimension that's summoning him here. And we see Saitama. So this is another huge reveal. This is confirming that Saitama is the direct reason why everything has been happening since the beginning of the series. Everybody's been saying, you know, for the longest time, like, oh, monster sightings have increased more and more lately. We're seeing demon and dragon level monsters way more commonly than we have before. And it's because of Saitama, because he removed his limiter and God is aware of it. And I know that for the longest time, I've been saying that I didn't think that God was aware of Saitama because he removed his limiter. I thought him removing it made him like become outside of God's view, but I was very wrong. I was foolish. Sorry about that. But yeah, God is very aware of Saitama removing his limiter because it's implied that God made the limiter himself because he was afraid that something like this was going to happen. And now that Saitama has removed the limiter, meaning that he is a direct threat to God himself, God is now like upping the ante and making more and more monsters and trying to create more and more powerful beings to be able to stop Saitama, but also simultaneously trying to have him being resurrected back to Earth, you know, trying to fulfill the prophecy, making that Orochi that can be powerful enough to be placed on the altar as well. But then Sitch is like, you know, anyway, Blast will return to us soon with a plan for countermeasures. Until then, our top priorities are unity and solidarity. So this is just putting a pin holder in there, being like, Blast will return, guys, and he's going to have a plan, but it's probably not going to be soon. But just know that he's eventually going to come back. So then everyone starts leaving and Zombie Man remembers back to what Dr. Genus had told him in chapter 88, and then I think it's 86 on the Viz. Like when Dr. Genus dumped all of that exposition about the limiter and how monsters are mean and all that stuff. And he was like, in exchange for removing his limiter, he lost his hair. And then he's like, someone removed their limiter, huh? And he sees Saitama in this instance. So Zombie Man is like thinking like, oh man, maybe Genos was telling the truth and Saitama is the one that Genus was talking about and he removed his freaking limiter. So like I said in the beginning, this is important because Zombie Man, Flashy Flash, who we also see being interested in Saitama and the chapter ending with a My Mask being interested in Saitama is super important because they're all going to be going after him in their own specific ways, which creates their own individual storylines. And these storylines are so much fun and I can't wait to see how the manga adapts. So this chapter opens up with us seeing Fubuki and the Blizzard group driving somewhere and Eyelashes is like, why on earth do you want to go to this place anyway? With the entirety of the Blizzard group and fully armed no less. And Fubuki says, I'm going to meet someone. There's a chance things will turn violent. So the big question here is like, where are they going? Like who's she going to meet up with? Nothing was really established for us to really know what's going to happen. I mean, if you read the webcomic, you know where this is going, but things happen differently in the manga than they did in the webcomic. So the connective tissue is going to be much different. And I'm not going to spoil anything, of course, but I'll just say that in my opinion, I think that things are going to turn violent with the person that she meets. Like we're going to see like a big Fubuki fight eventually happen. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that's where this is going. And whatever happens as a result, 
result of that fight is going to take us into what this arc is going to comprise of. And I know that my mask is taking up like the majority of this chapter and we're going to talk about him and he will have like an arc dedicated to him pretty much, or at least I think that he will, but that's going to happen like down the line, or at least I, I think it is. But speaking of my mask, we're coming to him in the handsome castle talent agency. And he's talking to the director there, basically telling him about the new idol group that they have and that they even like passed the pro hero exam and they're like the future for them essentially. And they're going to try to make them like big sellers the way that my mask is and he's trying to get a my mask to like endorse them saying that like hey i'm hoping that you'll give him a few nuggets of advice too maybe some tricks for surviving in this cutthroat entertainment industry so this group is called the bubbly boys and they're kind of like i don't know the bts of the one punch man world i mean they're not on that level obviously yet a my mask is but they're trying to build them up to be bts but a my mask doesn't even care and he's like you know i have zero interest in phonies so like don't speak to me but we see that he's looking at his phone because he's reviewing the security camera footage from two days ago when Saitama went to the Hero Association with Black S and Rover and it triggered Metal Knight's defense system and his robots attacked him and Saitama destroyed them. Now he told the Hero Association that the robots like malfunctioned and exploded on their own and that's what they all believe except for like a My Mask and Metal Knight of course and he sees that yeah it's actually Saitama that destroyed these freaking robots and this is like the beginning of My Mask realizing like the truth about Saitama which we'll get into but the director keeps pushing a My Mask about the Bubbly Boys and My Mask's like, you know, don't talk to me. It's like, you used me as an example and this is what you come up with. And then we see the bubbly boys come in and they're like, senpai, why you gotta be mean to us? Calling us phonies and fakes. If you get too cocky, just because you're the favorite, maybe we'll catch up to you before you know it. If we're talking song, dance, and looks, I'm confident we're just as every bit as good as you. And of course we got raw power too. And that's right, two of us passed the hero exam too. C class and A class, what's the difference anyway? Maybe you wanna find out. And this is like hilarious, of course, because they just made the bare minimum of the hero cut, like joining C class which is, I guess, somewhat impressive for this world. I mean, not just anybody can become a pro hero as we saw like in the first season, but obviously this is like classic One Punch Man character delusion as to where they don't even realize the huge gap between an A class and a C class, let alone a My Mask and them, who we all know is truly S class level. Going further, they're like, yeah, even the director told us that it would be better if My Mask could just concentrate on entertainment. He tries to maintain his persona at all times, so it's hard to handle it. But we're practical, so we're gonna use the lame title of hero as a stepping stone and aim for the true top idol spot. Unlike a certain someone who can't make up their mind whether he's a hero or an idol. And he'll go more into this afterwards, but as we've seen throughout the series, a My Mask is like a hero first and foremost. That's like the most important thing to him. Yes, being an idol is very important as well and keeping up appearances and everything else that he's contracted to, but he is like a true hero. I mean, yeah, he doesn't have the best morals and whatnot, but he does have a strong sense of what he believes justice is. And unlike them, he doesn't see being a hero as like a stepping stone to being an idol. Being an idol is more so just secondary to him, if anything, but still very important. But going further, my mask is like, hero is not a title that can be easily used as a stepping stone. And he's like, then what would you do if I was a monster? If one appeared in front of you like this? And that's really interesting. Going more into like, what is going on with a my mask really? Because we talked about this in the previous review, because it was brought up to the rest of the group in that meeting with Sitch that, you know, they now know that of course humans become monsters, but also monsters can appear to be humans. And my mask was kind of acting oblivious to it. And let me just replay what we had talked about with him. So this is interesting, of course, that a My Mask would be saying this because way back in the previous arc, after a My Mask had defeated Super S, we thought that he had killed her, but it turned out that he actually didn't. And when she woke up, she tasted his blood because she had stabbed him in the eye previously. She was like, this is monster blood. So that, along with a My Mask being able to regenerate from said grievous injury, along with him being ripped in half by Fear Ugly and having his face smashed in, it's looking like a My Mask is pretty much a monster at this point, or something like that, at the minimum. So it's like, yeah, does he know that he's a monster or does he not know or is he not a monster or is he like something in between the way that Garl was the verdict's still out but I'm sure we'll eventually find out what's going on with them right but anyway in response to a my mask saying like you know what would you do if I was a monster the bubbly boys say well then we'd beat you up you know it's seven on one and then a my mask starts getting vain and then like activates like his conquerors hockey on them and they're just all shook and they start shivering and they can't move and he's like that's your instincts warning you, you and I are far too different biologically. And it's like, again, is he just saying that to show the difference between how much better he is than them? Or is he saying like, you know, biologically, cause I'm a freaking monster. Then he goes into classic Vania my mask mode and he's like, none of you have it. 
you don't have beauty, beauty like his. And then we see him like picturing Saitama, the beauty of overwhelming power. So it's like, yeah, that's the key word there. My mask knows that Saitama is pretty much the one above all, which is huge because now we have another character who knows the truth about him. Believe it or not, we don't have many characters that know the truth at this point in the series. I mean, there are some of them that know Saitama's strong, but they're still kind of in delusion about it. Like Flashy Flash, for example. So like, am I mask acknowledging this is a big deal because he's just as delusional as Flashy Flash and just as pompous as well. So like I said, this is a big deal and my mask is going to be pursuing Saitama after this. Like he's not just going to stop here. And this whole sequence setting up how like the Bubbly Boys are going to be the successors of the new top idols. This is kind of establishing what my mask is looking for. He's not looking for the Bubbly Boys. He's looking for Saitama. And like I said before, we will come around to what my mask ultimately wants to do with Saitama here, but it's probably going to take a while to get to that. There's a lot of other things that need to happen before that. But then we're coming to Saitama in his apartment and he's finally meeting up with the A-class heroes that are his neighbors, Forte, Butterfly, DX, and Chain and Toad. They're introducing themselves and he introduces himself to them. And we find out that like Chain and Toad is like wearing this mask because it gives him character and he becomes more popular with the kids as a result. We saw him in Death Gatling's group that went against Garo. Butterfly DX also just kind of says that he's popular. We don't really get too much insight to his abilities, but I guess he can kind of fly. We saw that he was with the group that was taking on Hunter Eyes Octopus with Flashy Flash. And then Forte says that he listens to music and battles with his rhythm and that he's kind of popular too. And then Saitama's like, is it working up a rhythm every time you fight really pointless? And that angers Forte. And he's like, you and me, Baldy, outside right now. I'll show you my strength. And that's where the chapter ends. And it's like, yeah, he obviously doesn't understand what he's getting himself into. And if I'm thinking that this is going to play out the way that it does in the webcomic, the opening sequence of the next chapter is going to be like amazingly hilarious and like you can't even really guess what's going to happen. All I can say is that it's just really funny and just so one. Like the way that one writes like these awesome comedic sequences, it's just like perfect. But so coming off of the previous chapter, we saw Saitama talking to his new neighbors in the class A apartments of the Hero Association. And they were basically trying to haze him, I suppose. And the first chance that Forte got to challenge Saitama to like a fight to, I guess, prove his dominance, he took. And as they're about to take it outside, we come to the beginning of this chapter where we see Saitama running back into Black S and Rover. And Black S is like, hey, please don't leave me outside. I swear I'll make myself useful, boss. And he decides to make a wager with Forte. And he's like, hey, if we're gonna fight, how about loser takes care of these guys? And Forte agrees. But then he also sees that like, you know, they're weird and Black S starts acting like a monkey again. And it seems like the only sensible one here is Butterfly DX because he's like, you sure this isn't some kind of monster? It's not dangerous, is it? And I think this might be like the purpose of this group here because they're like oddly prevalent. Like they're going to be around for a while coming in and out of the story. So I guess it's just so that they take care of Black S and Rover because I'm sure you've seen that Black S is very similar to a character from Mob Cycle 100. So I assume that they're going to wind up having very similar arcs ultimately. But we cut to Saitama taking on Forte and we found out in the previous chapter that Forte fights using like rhythm by listening to music. But considering that he can't hear anything since he's wearing headphones, he winds up getting hit by a car. <laughs> and this is like classic one writing. But it turns out that he was hit by the Blizzard group because we saw in the previous chapter that they were driving somewhere. Somewhere where they thought they were going to have to get violent. And it turns out that they were coming to the Hero Association. So then we see Fubuki and Saitama meet up again. They haven't talked in a long time. I can't even remember the last time that they talked. But they have some small talk, and then we're cutting to the underground parking lot underneath the Hero Association, and we see this new guy who we haven't seen before, and he's wearing like this jokery mask. And when I say new, I mean he's like new, new. Like he's not even in the webcom. And he's like meeting with some Hero Association higher ups, I assume. But he's also an expert because he has like this psychic energy coming off of him, so much so that it's like making Fubuki nervous. And then she asks Saitama to come with them. But they head into the Hero Association, and they're going going towards the special internment facility. And once they get there, they find out that the person they're trying to visit is being visited by someone else and that they're actually going to be transferred afterwards. And they're basically getting denied entry. And Fubuki's like, no, you got to stop the current visitation. This is an emergency. And then we cut to the person they're trying to see and it turns out that it's friggin' Psychos. So yeah, Psychos is being contained by the Hero Association here. And this is interesting because we haven't seen her for a very long time. Like I think the last
last time we saw her when she was like observing the first round of Cosmic Fear Garo versus Saitama. And then after that, we kind of didn't see her again. So one thing led to another and she wound up being contained by the Hero Association here. I mean, we're going to find out how it happened at the end of the chapter, but for now, we don't really know. But she's being visited by this Joker mask guy. And he says that according to our surveillance data, this individual was able to fight on ground with Tatsumaki. And this makes sense because when Psychos was like in Sairochi mode fighting against Tatsumaki, it was being like broadcasted on the news. It makes sense that he would have this data. And he goes on to say that she's like a valuable specimen and that he appreciates the Hero Association providing her to them. And they're like, oh, you know, we've been short on funding lately, so we can't thank you enough for such a large transaction. We've already stripped her of all of her human rights by certifying her as a monster, so you're free to conduct whatever experiments you wish. Guys, so this is interesting, right? It goes more into like the corruption of the Hero Association, something that has been lingering in the background of the story, like how they do a lot of shady business behind the scenes. I mean, this was more so touched on in like one of the bonus chapters from a long time ago. Like Metal Knight discovered that they had like this underground monster trafficking ring thing going on, where they were selling off like parts of monsters and stuff to like the highest bidder. Monsters that were like captured by Metal Knight for experimentation and research. And Metal Knight cracked down on it, you know, good guy Metal Knight. But like I said, this just goes more into the corrupt side of the Hero Association, which will be explored more in these next upcoming chapters. But it's like, they're going so far as to where they're just straight up like trafficking people here. But the Joker mask guy who's buying her says that for us Sukuyomi, this sample will no doubt bring about a great leap forward in our research. So this Sukuyomi group is brand new, not in the webcomic, never heard about them before. But when Psychos hears this, she like wakes up and goes like goblin mode on this guy. But he produces like a barrier and shields against her and then like knocks her out with like a psychic bullet or something. And this is crazy impressive because we know that Psychos is pretty powerful. I mean, obviously she's not Sairochi level, but by herself, she was designated dragon level. So I guess this guy is at minimum dragon himself, right? But he's like, now, now, this would all be for naught if we ended up damaging your precious brain because here within the third eye we've heard so much about lies the secret into seeing the future. We'll perform a very thorough craniotomy on her back at the lab. All right, so a lot to go in here. I'm just going to speculate about what I think is going on. Again, this is all new. New, not spoiling anything, but I think that this guy and the group Sukuyomi that he's tied to might be the group that we saw take Tatsumaki when she was a kid that was also experimenting on that monster thing and also was implied to have a cube because we saw that when Blast saved Tatsumaki back in the day, he had a cube in his hand. And I'm assuming that he went to that facility to get the cube. So that might mean that this guy is aware of the cube and also maybe aware of God because, you know, he says research and he's going after Psychos and she's an Esper and craniotomy and all that stuff. But aside from that, he also says the third eye lies the secret to seeing it in the future. So this is probably going to be fully explained in the next chapter, but I'll just say for now that third eye, seeing into the future, think back to like season one, when there was another character who could see into the future, a very important character who still has ramifications on the story to this day. It is all connected, but we'll talk about it in the next chapter review. But anyway, we're cutting back to Fubuki and Saitama taking the elevator seemingly down to where Psychos is. And as they're coming down, Fubuki is having like this flashback to like moments after Garo ran away after his fight with Saitama was over. And it turns out that Psychos wasn't too far away from that. And we see Fubuki finding her amongst the rubble. And this is like the big moment where they're finally coming face to face with each other because they apparently have a history. They've known each other because they went to high school together. And Psychos resents Fubuki because when she was 17 and her powers were allegedly about to surpass Fubuki's, Fubuki then sealed Psychos' powers. Now, how she did this, I don't know, with some Espery stuff, but according to this sequence, she did it in some extra special way. <laughs> I, I mean, take from this what you will. <laughs> but Psychos is like, when I was about to rise to the top of the world, you're going to stand in my way again? And Fubuki's like, that's right, I was a self-centered person. Back when you proposed the Society for Supernatural Research Exterminates Humanity plan, the people around me said things like, that's inhumane. The vice president lost her mind. But for me, all I could think was, once I surpassed my sister and stood at the top of the world, there would be no point in being at the top if nobody else was there. So yeah, this goes back to who Fubuki originally was before we saw her have tons of character development. Because even if you go back to like when we first get introduced to her, she was very 
very different than how she is now. And, you know, that was more blossoming in high school. And of course, a lot of it has to do with her upbringing and also the way that Tatsumaki treated her. But the whole thing about psychos being all crazy here, the whole Society for Supernatural Research Exterminates Humanity plan, obviously that is like the beginning of what the Monster Association eventually became. And we're going to find out probably in the next chapter how she came to manifest this plan because it just didn't happen out of nowhere. Like there's a trigger that caused psychos to become all crazy and unhinged like this. But this led them to having beef or more so Fubuki having beef with psychos. And then we come back to them fighting and psychos is like launching all of these like spiked rock boulders things at her. And they have like this clash and we come to the very end of the chapter where they're about to just face off. Like it's going to be Fubuki versus Psychos coming into the next chapter. And on paper, Psycho should just destroy her, right? Because like I said, Psycho's designated as a dragon. Fubuki, you know, B-class hero, although she could deflect some of Rover's blasts, which is like maybe her best. So coming off of the previous chapter, we found out that the Hero Association had Psychos in prison this whole time, and they were planning on selling her off to this Esper group called Sukuyomi. And Fubuki came to the Hero Association in hopes of trying to stop this from happening. And as she was making her way down with Saitama to get to where Psychos is being held. We went into like two different flashbacks. So the first flashback was right after Garo was defeated. We saw that Fubuki had found where Psychos was hiding. And that brought us into a flashback of them apparently being classmates in high school. And that brings us to the beginning of this chapter. And we're essentially seeing Psychos' descent into madness, I suppose, where we see her being like really obsessive about this group that she's in with Fubuki called the Society for Supernatural Research. But going further, we see Psychos reading this book, trying to learn this new ability called the third eye. She says, if I can manage to pull this off, I'll be able to predict the future just like the great prophet Shibawa. So that's a reveal right there, I guess, right? It's confirming or kind of confirming that Shibawa was an esper. And like before I found this out, I didn't really think too much of Shibawa and her abilities. I thought she was just kind of unique in the fact that she could do that. But no, it turns out that she was an esper who could utilize the third eye ability. I guess she was like the master of it because she did accurately predict the future. I mean, that was like her duty before she she died. She would like foresee all of these great disasters that would happen and then let whoever needed to know, you know, Hero Association, whoever before that, and then that's how they would be able to stop these disasters from happening and until, you know, she eventually saw the prophecy, you know, the end of the world thing that started off the series and she died from choking afterwards. And speaking of that, it turns out that Psycho's pretty much saw the same thing that Shibawa saw only much earlier than she did because this was like years ago when she was in high school and Shibawa only saw this prophecy like two months ago or something in like the current timeline of the story. Hey also guys, if you like my One Punch Man content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. But yeah, this is like the beginning of Psycho's going crazy, essentially, because when she sees the vision, it's presented as just all of these lines and whatnot. Like, of course, we don't get to see this because this is like a big deal. Like, maybe we'll see what their visions were eventually, but it sends her off into like this crazy psychotic rant where she's basically saying that humans suck, <laughs> more or less, and that there's no point in even taking over the world and like ruling them. The only thing left to do is just to essentially kill them all. And yeah, this is where she goes insane and starts telling this to everybody else, including the group, which we saw in the previous chapter. And this is more or less what caused Fubuki to seal off her powers. Not necessarily because she was going to kill everybody or had these crazy plans, but more so because, and keep in mind this is high school Fubuki, but Fubuki wanted to rule over everyone. And if Psychos were to kill everyone, then Fubuki would have no one to rule over. So she sealed off Psychos' powers in some unknown way. But, but yeah, this is the reasoning as to why. And I don't know how Psychos unsealed her powers. Either she did it through training or God did it for her. But we're coming back to the end of Psychos taking on Fubuki. And Fubuki somehow defeats her here. And this is pretty impressive, of course, because Fubuki is, you know, B-class rank one, which is technically like A-class hero, but still, Psychos is designated as a dragon. And yeah, Psychos came into the battle, you know, weakened and fatigued or whatever, but still, Fubuki doing this is incredible. I mean, Fubuki was doing her stuff too, you know, healing people and everything. And surprisingly, it's not being explained in the manga version how Fubuki is defeating Psychos. It is explained in the webcomic, so I don't think it's going to be retconned. I think how she's defeating Psychos here is going to be explained 
than like the next chapter or the next two chapters because there is like a specific way that she's doing it and it's like kind of integral to Fubuki as a character as well as like her power set so I assume this will be explained a little later but she asks Psychos like you know what is it that you saw in the future and after she knocks her out she kind of like goes into her head she's like you know what exactly changed you is this a source of your madness something we'll find out when the future comes and then suddenly like God appears above them and Fubuki's definitely aware that you know something is going on right now I mean she's not aware that it's God of course so yeah this definitely proves that obviously God is behind prophecy and everything as we knew and is able to like tap into the third eye or something and it seems like if you're like a good morally just person the way that Shibawa was you could possibly die from seeing the vision because she choked on like a cough drop or something but it's possible that God forced her to do that I don't know but it seems like if you're evil or be able to be manipulated into becoming evil the way that Psychos was then he'll just make you his disciple essentially because this is all like God's plan you know, like influence the person who's capable of orchestrating your plan like planting these thoughts into Psycho's head so she eventually makes the monster association and eventually makes Orochi because Orochi is prophesized to be placed on the altar to bring God back to the earth it's all part of his plan and it has to start somewhere although I'm sure he's tried this many times but we come back to Fubuki and Saitama finally making it down to where Psycho's is being held and they meet up with that Joker guy from the Tsukuyomi group and she's like this visitation's over everyone has to evacuate this room immediately you guys added Psycho's to the incarceration list so now this information accessible by any pro hero meaning that my sister Tatsumaki is probably going to see it and she's going to come here to finish her off and what do you know she does that immediately and she like rips the ceiling off and Saitama's like I see the person behind the destruction of my house this is important because this is kind of like Saitama's little mini quest right here or what's been going on after he defeated Gar we're trying to figure out like who destroyed his apartment and technically it was Tatsumaki you know when she was fighting Sairochi but don't you think that it probably would have been destroyed sooner or later in that massive battle that was going on but still somebody has to take the blame I suppose and it's gonna be Tatsumaki essentially right so just keep that in mind that Saitama is kind of upset about this so Tatsumaki busts in and she's like why is she still alive and she tries to like throw rocks on her but the Joker guy and Fubuki kind of like shield Psychos from her and then Tatsumaki just sends the Joker guy into the wall easily and it seems like like Fubuki and Tatsumaki are about to fight or something like Fubuki's protecting Psychos from Tatsumaki trying to crush her and she's like what are you trying to pull Fubuki did you get brainwashed or something no turns out that this is actually a ruse orchestrated by Tatsumaki and that they're actually not at odds here kind of just putting on a performance because we're going into another flashback and this is seemingly happening sometime before they meet up here and Tatsumaki is telling Fubuki that like yes yeah, Sukuyomi you know the group that the Joker guy's a part of she says that they're the psychic research organization that locked me up and used me as a guinea pig. Those guys are after psychos. So this is pretty cool. This is what we speculated about in the previous video, that the Tsukuyomi group is probably the same group that had Tatsumaki when she was a kid and running experiments on her and stuff like that. And Blast eventually saved her from that place. But he also had a cube in his hand. And I was like, those guys probably, you know, were doing cube research as well and probably know more or less what God is, or at least that God is out there. And it turns out, yeah, it's true. This guy is coming from the very same group. And Tatsumaki wants to work together with Fubuki here to protect Psychos from being taken by them. And she says that she has her reasons, but I think it's because, first of all, she doesn't want that group to get Psychos because that's not good, but also because I think she knows that Psychos is being manipulated by God, or at least by someone. I mean, she kind of figured this out when she was fighting Sairochi, but maybe more or less came to that conclusion afterwards, especially once she was encountered by God himself, impersonating as Blast. Although she was kind of like half awake when that happened, I'm pretty sure she realizes what's going on here. So she's trying to give Psychos a redemption, possibly, while also, you know, not having the bad guys take her and then manipulate her and, and use her to their benefit. But then the joke Joker guy gets up and like destroys the security camera and knocks out the Hero Association executives. And Tatsumaki's like, huh, I guess there's a tiny bit of progress in the development of artificial psychics after all. So that's interesting. Turns out that that Tsukuyomi group is making artificial psychics or espers. This is something that we didn't really know before, but it makes sense considering all the research that they're doing. And I don't know exactly how they're doing it. I'm sure there's some kind of operation you could do, but it's possible that they're also using the cube to make this happen as well, because they were kind of using the cube to make monsters or something something so they could probably make espers from it too if not it's kind of just figuring out how the esper brain is wired and then them 
trying to replicate that on somebody else. But this guy's pretty powerful despite not being like a naturally born Esper. And it's even stated by Fubuki. So I also said that this guy's probably dragon level and it seems like that's probably the case. But Saitama's like, you know, hey, I came here to say a few words to you for destroying my place, but it doesn't seem like you're sorry at all about it. So remember, Saitama not happy about this. And Fubuki's like, I'm lucky you came along, Saitama. I see great strength in you. You've been playing dumb about it, but I think you're the one who defeated Garo. And Saitama's like, no, I honestly don't remember. And this is of course because his future self fused with his present self. And I don't know the memories of everything that happened between him and Garo in space and a little bit before that kind of just got wiped along with the power increase that he got. So he generally doesn't know that he defeated Garo, which is good and convenient for the story going forward. But Fubuki's like, Garo was someone who had reached a peak and ascended. Having taken him down, you're probably somebody who has ascended as well. It's interesting how ascended is being used here. This could be a way to indicate somebody who has gone past the limiter, removed it in Saitama's case, broken it in Garo's case, or have just been given like power beyond the limiter from God possibly. I don't know that for sure, but it seems to be the implication here. But the Joker guy like clashes with Tatsumaki psychically or something, and the ground splits underneath Saitama and he just falls beneath and he lands inside of this monster containment cage with all like these demon levels and I'm assuming that Metal Knight put these monsters here for like you know research and development you know making his robots as strong as they are and whatnot but there's probably also a nefarious element to this that Metal Knight doesn't condone or maybe isn't even really necessarily aware of which I think we'll get into in the next couple chapters but Saitama's down here and obviously the stakes aren't very high I mean even if they were all like dragon levels the stakes would still be non-existent we know that Saitama could just snap his fingers and then they'll all explode but there is more to this but that's where the chapter ends and let me know what you thought about this chapter in the comments guys if you liked the video please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already have a great day i'll see you in the next one